Okay, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for the day three folks showing up. Uh, it'll, I'm certain you will uh, be rewarded with an excellent program today as you have for the other two days. And we're kicking off this morning with a conversation with Gaber Graywall, the Division Director of Enforcement at the SEC. And uh, thank you so much, Gaber, for coming back and doing this again. <clears throat> uh, it's always interesting to hear what you have to say. Kabir, I don't think needs a lot of introduction, but I will introduce him nonetheless. And of course, you can see all the um, bios online for all the speakers uh, and panelists uh, today as for the other days. Kabir is the director of the Division of Enforcement. He was the attorney general for the state of New York. He was also the Bergen County prosecutor, the, I think, largest county in uh, New in Jersey. Jersey. Yep. Um, he was also an AUSA for, in the District of New Jersey and the Eastern District of New York, and he was also in private practice. And so, Gabriel, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, did you need to say anything first? No, I mean, thank you for having me. Thanks to PLI for inviting me back. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess that's a prompt for my disclaimer that my yeah. views this morning uh, reflect my own views in my official capacity as the director of the Division of Enforcement. <clears throat> they don't reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or the staff. So with that out of the way, let's Okay, let's, okay, let's I, didn't, I didn't want you to get in trouble <laughs> there, yeah. So, um, so you've just finished a fiscal year at the end of September, and, um, what are some of the matters or topics that you'd like to highlight? We always are interested in uh, the view of, of the year past, and then, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's headed our way. Sure. Um, you, you know, if you've heard me speak before, you, you've heard me talk about the need to move our cases with a sense of urgency mm -hmm. and how that's important for both accountability and enhancing public trust in our markets and, and regulators and our financial institutions. And I think. FY23 showed that we moved with a sense of urgency to protect investors uh, in just about every possible space and by every possible metric. The, the numbers are not out yet. The numbers are, are going to be released soon. Uh, the chair, though, did talk about some of the numbers. And again, they are a metric, but not the only metric. But last fiscal year, uh, we brought more than 780 total mm -hmm. uh, enforcement actions, and that's higher than uh, several prior fiscal years. Uh, we brought more than 500 standalone actions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also higher and, and more in line with the pre-pandemic years, which I think speaks to how the staff is moving with that sense of urgency that I mentioned. Uh, total money ordered uh, was in the neighborhood of $5 billion, which mm -hmm. is the second highest year on record uh, in commission history. Importantly, though, $933 million were returned to investors. Uh, that money was returned to investors who were made whole uh, through disgorgement and other penalties that we obtained. And I think that speaks to uh, how the staff is both in our enforcement actions and then in the remedies that we seek, uh, trying to protect investors and make them whole where they've been harmed uh, by, uh, by bad actors in our markets. So I think that's the number side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as the chair spoke about uh, just several weeks ago, those numbers don't capture the the affinity fraud matter, right? That mm -hmm. that might be the most important, um, uh, you know, action that we take for, for a particular individual who lost maybe $5,000 or $10,000. Mm -hmm. And so there were a range of actions that we brought uh, touching on all aspects of the, the markets that we police uh, and you know, protecting investors. And some of the other takeaways that, that I would highlight from last fiscal year would be our use of sweeps and initiatives as well. Uh -huh. uh, we had the books and records sweep, uh, which began in uh, the prior fiscal year, but last fiscal year, uh, we brought 23 actions uh, in, in those uh, suite of cases. And uh, the penalties in those matters were around 390 million. Uh, mm -hmm. And that brings the total in those books and records matters to about 40 matters over the last two years and $1.5 billion in penalties. Again, using all the tools at our disposal to address risk that we're seeing in the markets to make sure that folks are, are playing within the chalk lines as the chair likes to speak mm -hmm. about. And I think that use of sweeps and initiatives in this particular space shows how we could use those tools because in, in a way to change behaviors. Because mm -hmm. when you go to conferences like this one, when you go to other conferences, 
those matters are being talked about. Mm -hmm. Folks are taking these, these issues seriously. Compliance departments are addressing these risks and concerns. And so I think you will see more of that in uh, the year to come, more in that in the sense, uh, I'm speaking not just books and records cases, but us using sweeps and initiatives to send a message where we're seeing risk in a particular space. Mm -hmm. I think moving ahead, like we did this past fiscal year, you saw us bring a lot of matters in the crypto space, mm -hmm. focused on intermediaries, and where we see uh, that same type of misconduct moving forward, you will continue to see us bringing actions to protect investors in the crypto space, focusing on intermediaries. Uh, you will continue to see us leveraging our tools like we did this past fiscal year to address abusive trading practices like insider trading. Uh, you know, again, I've spoken about this in the past. When insiders abuse their positions of trust, that diminishes trust in our capital markets. It diminishes trust, uh, and folks are left to question, you know, are people playing by two sets of rules where insiders mm -hmm. are taking advantage of their positions and not being held accountable sometimes. And so uh, that's going to remain a, a, an area of focus. And uh, two other areas that I would uh, also touch on, disclosures and controls issues around cybersecurity incidents. Uh, you saw us uh, bring a number of cases in that space this past fiscal year. That remains a concern for us. Uh, if you're telling the markets you're doing something in a particular space, you should be doing that. Mm -hmm. If you're telling the markets that you have particular controls in place around cybersecurity, you should be doing what you're saying you're doing because mm -hmm. the risks are so great. We understand that there are issuers are, are constantly under threat mm -hmm. by hackers, sometimes nation state hackers, sometimes those that are financially motivated. That's all the more reason to make sure that you're doing everything possible to mitigate those risks and telling the investing public truthfully what you're doing in that space. The final uh, point that I'll make, and again, we're, we're going to cover all the risk areas that we traditionally cover, and mm -hmm. there's too many to, to mention, uh, would be around whistleblower protections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we brought a number of cases uh, over the last fiscal year where you had issuers, and in one case, a private company as well, that took actions that violated Rule 21 F17 of Dodd-Frank, uh, impeding whistleblowers from contacting the SEC. Mm -hmm. Our whistleblower program is an important part of our enforcement program. And if issuers and others are taking steps to prevent people from coming forward and, and, and sharing information with us about malfeasance or about bad acts that are taking place uh, at a particular firm, uh, that undermines our program. We can't mm -hmm. be everywhere at once. That's why mm -hmm. we need whistleblowers the, the, the whistleblower program. That's why we need in-house folks to, to help us uh, in, in self-reporting and, and coming forward and, and telling us what's going on uh, and working with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you'll, you'll continue to see an emphasis there. And, and just to link it back to the books and records cases that I talked about a moment and ago. And when you say books and records, are you talking about the off-channel communications? I, I am. Yeah, I okay. am. In mm -hmm. shorthand, I'm talking about the off-channel communications uh -huh. matters. So where you, know, you had large broker-dealers and advisors who were not retaining records that mm -hmm. were required to be maintained uh, by them. Uh, in most of those cases, you know, we get a lot of criticism about these actions that we're somehow trying to police all conversations that are happening at a broker-dealer or a firm. But if you look at the orders in those cases, you had people taking deliberate steps to talk about deals and to talk about their work outside of the, the, the channels that were being recorded and maintained and mm -hmm. taking those work-related conversations, not conversations about having lunch, not mm -hmm. conversations about having drinks after work, not conversations about you know, what people are doing on the weekend, but conversations about the work that they were doing, taking that off channel. Mm -hmm. That's a concern. Mm -hmm. But in all of those cases, there was one that did not look like the others. Mm -hmm. There was one example where there was a self-report, and the penalties were considerably less than the penalties uh, with respect to the other uh, firms involved. I highlight that also to highlight that despite the, the, the numbers that I shared with you earlier and the, the penalties that we saw, saw it and the total money ordered, I think last year more than any other year in the commission's recent history, at least what I'm aware of, mm -hmm. we highlighted many actions, many actions where there were reduced or zero penalties because of an individual or an entity's cooperation. So it's not all about the higher penalties and the higher numbers. It's also about recognizing that we need people who are out there identifying misconduct in-house to come forward. Mm 
and, and that there are real benefits to coming forward and cooperating in our matters. And the way we can speak to that, the way the Commission speaks to that, is through our orders, highlighting the types of behaviors that resulted in meaningful cooperation credit. So I expect that that will continue also this fiscal year, that there will be more detail in the orders that the Commission issues talking about what is meaningful cooperation that gets rewarded. Always helpful for defense counsel and for in-house counsel who's trying to explain that there actually are ways to mitigate um, problems when they're, when they're found. When you say um, uh, impede whistleblowers, obviously the whistleblower, whistleblower provisions in Dodd-Frank have been a game changer right. um, for everyone. Um, is that through um, separation agreements that try to limit, or is it, um, uh, okay, you still have a job, but you're in a room by yourself um, with nothing to do, or? It, it's more the former that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in separation agreements and in employment agreements that yeah. uh, you're not going to go to a regulator or to, uh, to the government without first notifying us, or that mm -hmm. you're going to uh, give up your right to get a whistleblower award, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, by the terms of this agreement, and, mm -hmm. and so it's in the employment agreements. And we saw, uh, you know, a number of these cases six, seven, eight years ago, and we expected folks who are, you know, working in this space, folks who are working in house or in the HR function, to to pick up on those cases because, right. uh, and, and to update their agreements. Right. But, you know, I I think part of it is agreements not being updated. I think part of it is folks not knowing the rules and it's not, you know, it's, it's not an excuse here for these violations. And yeah, so it, it, it's, it, hopefully that message gets out there. Yeah, it's interesting because certainly I, you know, I, I think many people here do remember that there was a rash of cases yeah. and I think there was a lot of activity to revise agreements and that right. sort of thing. And people were wondering sort of what, where the parameters were. So probably not bad to have a refresher. I will tell you regarding the off-channel communications, I think the defense bar has seen a lot of clients go in and dramatically change how they are capturing that because it is, it is low hanging fruit in terms of what you can change to avoid interacting with even That's though you're a hear. delightful person, Kabir, <laughs> um, best to avoid uh, those, those interactions. You know, um, one of the cases that was brought last year, Solar Winds, has been a particular focus. Um, you charged Solar Winds and its uh, CISO uh, in connection with alleged cybersecurity uh, risks and vulnerabilities. Um, what should folks come away from with that? And I will tell you this um, I think that people are particularly focused on. The um, the individual um, that the CISO that was sued because you know there are people in positions of like that that are wondering how vulnerable they are. So what can you tell us about that? You, you know I think um, I see a lot of similarities when we have this conversation around CISOs with the conversation that we sometimes have around CCO liability. Right, right. And, and to me, you know, what, what I would say with respect to CCOs is the same uh, that I would say with respect to CISOs. And it's that we're not looking to second guess good faith decisions that are based uh, on a CISO or a mm -hmm. CCO's, you know, reasonable analysis and reasonable inquiry. Mm -hmm. Also, what I say with respect to CISOs uh, sorry, CCOs, is that it, just because you're a CCO, it doesn't mean that you're immune from liability. It's not a get out of jail free card. So the title really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We're looking in both cases, whether it's a CCO or the CISO, as to what they knew, what they did, what, what red flags were, were known to them. Mm -hmm. Did they avoid those red flags? Did they ignore them? Did they mm -hmm. make statements that were contrary to the information that they had at the time? Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about this case, which is in litigation, solar winds and the case against their now CISO, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Brown, mm -hmm. I think that's important to keep in mind. I think it's also important to keep in mind is that uh, Mr. Brown is a CISO now. He wasn't the CISO at the relevant time. At the time, he was the vice president of systems, or sorry, vice president of security and architecture. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's what they knew, what the conduct mm -hmm. was. And if you look at that complaint, you will see that what the SEC is not doing here is exercising 2020 vision, looking back in hindsight. That complaint goes to Lentz to explain what the company knew at the time, 
what the individual knew at the time, mm -hmm. all the red flags, and how they were contrary to the public statements being made at the time. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not second guessing someone's good faith judgment and, and analysis based on what they knew at the time. And, and you know, mm -hmm. th these are difficult jobs and we understand that, but it's more in that particular case. Again, I point everyone to the complaint about how there were obvious red flags that were ignored and, and the public statements that were made and the involvement that the individual had, regardless of the title, in the making of those public statements, that's what prompted the liability. That's what prompted the enforcement action. It mm -hmm. wasn't simply the person's title. Mm -hmm. It was what they did, what they knew, and what they, what they said contrary to what they knew. So I think uh, that's an important takeaway uh, from that action. And it's like every other action. It's on the facts and circumstances. It's not increased liability because you're a CISO. Mm -hmm. It's not less liability because you're a CISO. It's what you did, what you said, and, and what the facts were that were known to you at the time. It's not us second guessing mm -hmm. with 2020 hindsight. Well, I think that's that's very interesting and helpful. I think it has been lost uh, on what Mr. Brown's title was, our position was at the time of the relevant conduct. <coughs> um, I think that's right. I mean, he's. if you look at that time, he was not the CISO. He was later mm -hmm. promoted to the CISO yeah. after the, yeah. the sunburst attack. Uh, and, and the other thing I will say is, to the point that these are difficult jobs, yeah. it's the same thing we hear when we talk about CISOs and CISO liability, sorry, CCO liability. Right. It's like an alphabet soup. Yeah, uh, with, with, with CCO liability, we often hear from CISOs that CCOs, CCOs yeah. that they're not getting the support that they need. Mm -hmm. They're not getting the resources mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. What we've heard, interestingly enough, and what we've read in some of the comments after this particular enforcement action is that Many in the CISO community are pointing to this enforcement action as a way to go to their boards right. and say, we need more resources, we need mm -hmm. more support. Mm -hmm. So that's encouraging yeah. that, you know, th that this is prompting that conversation, which is probably long overdue. Right. Now, all, all enforcement uh, matters have both a general and specific deterrent factor. And, right. And um, I know that you're always trying to send a message beyond just that matter. Um, and I think, um, I think the message has been heard. Um, there previously was a lot of talk, um, certainly this year on the prior two days where we focused on corporate disclosure and, and issues. Um, we certainly talked about ESG, but not as much as the prior year, I think. And, um, but I noticed that in the um, exam um, uh, piece that they put out every year talking about what they're going to be focused on. ESG was not in, for the exam staff that wasn't in their, their guidance as to what they'd be focused on. And some people said to me that there were only two ESG enforcement matters, although I question whether the number was four. Right. Um, maybe you could clarify that. Goldman and DSW, but then I thought McDonald's and Activision were two. But where, where is, from an enforcement perspective, where is the, the commission on ESG? So for, from, from my perspective, from the enforcement perspective, ESG remains uh, a, a risk area for us. That we're, and your, your view is important here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's important to us because ESG remains important to investors. Uh, mm -hmm. It's important to investors and issuers continue to speak on ESG for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, funds and others are marketing ESG products for that reason. So because of that, interest, we continue to be focused here when uh, there are cases like you, you mentioned, the Goldman Sachs asset management case and, mm -hmm. and the uh, Deutsche Bank subsidiary case where mm -hmm. they were marketing ESG related products and making statements uh, around what was going into their investment decisions. But in reality, uh, they were not abiding by those, mm -hmm. those uh, criteria. They were not uh, using those same criteria when they were making the investment decision, their scorecards and, and things mm -hmm. of that nature mm -hmm. uh, internally. And so there were those two matters uh, this past fiscal year. I would uh, also include Activision and mm -hmm. I would also include McDonald's mm -hmm. uh, in the S&G uh, category. Right. I think McDonald's was an important case uh, around social and governance issues. I think Activision Blizzard as well uh, touched on that. And I would also include in, in the SG suite of cases the whistleblower matters that we brought, because I think they speak yeah. to governance issues. They uh -huh. speak to uh, cultural issues at, at, a, at a entity. And so I think there were a number of actions that we brought, uh, again, going back to what I was talking about earlier about 
uh, where uh, entities through employment agreements were impeding whistleblowers from contacting regulators. So mm -hmm. I think they all uh, fall into the same category. And I think that they all touch on the S&G part of it as well. And it, mm -hmm. it remains uh, a priority for us because it's a priority for investors. Clearly, there's a lot of people that focus on the E and not the S and the G. That's correct. Um, that's right. Um, you know, one thing, um, I'm, I'm sure people in the audience, but I, I will just point out that there's a controversy as to whether administrative proceedings are, I guess, constitutional. I guess that's how I'd, I'm trying to summarize something very quickly here. Um, and it is a matter before the, the Supreme Court. And so we haven't been seeing litigated... Um, administrative proceedings, in which it's <coughs> prudent, um, and I know it's been explained to me that you can do a lot still through district court, um, but not everything. And um, I haven't noticed as many, well, certainly 102E actions, which are matters against auditors, um, barring them from appearing or practicing before the commission. Um, you're obviously not going to be seeing those. Um, what what impact? Um, some people have suggested there aren't as many cases against auditors, and um, is that accurate? Is it because of the administrative proceeding issue, or what can you say about that? So, uh, gatekeepers, and I probably should have mentioned this, uh, you know, at the top of our conversation, remain mm -hmm. a priority for us. They mm -hmm. hold a, a role of, of trust in our capital markets, and when they fall down on their jobs, it 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 impacts uh, negatively on that trust that we're trying to, to enhance and build um, with the investing public. And so um, I don't think we've slowed down in, in our auditor cases. Um, we, you're right, have not been engaged in contested uh, mm -hmm. APs, uh, 102Es, mm -hmm. but there have been a number of settled 102Es involving auditors and accountants and mm -hmm. others licensed to appear before the commission. Uh, so that tool remains available to us, and, and we have used it. Uh, but just because there's uncertainty as to the administrative form and, and what that will look like uh, based on what the Supreme Court decides in Jarcusy mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we don't have other avenues, like you alluded to mm -hmm. earlier. We have brought contested matters in district court uh, involving auditors, using our tools and authorities there mm -hmm. uh, to hold uh, auditors accountable. And so I think you'll continue to see us doing that. It's important uh, for our program to make sure that uh, when we see someone uh, falling short in, in that space, to, to hold them accountable. And, and we're not going to delay that accountability until mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court matter is decided. So there, there are other avenues for us, and we have been using those. Uh, there have been settled 102Es, um, you know, both, uh, you know, sort of 102E2s and 3s would be you know, based on uh, district court uh, mm -hmm. injunctions. So, mm -hmm. um, so we'll continue to use those tools. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, are there any, fo I know sometimes there's been a focus on attorneys or other gatekeepers in particular, members of the board, are any general thoughts on that? All of them. <laughs> you know, okay. I think, uh -huh. you know, again, um, I, 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 I've said this a uh, hundred times probably in, in, in this role. Uh, I, I really think I really think everyday folks are losing trust in, in our markets. They were losing mm -hmm. trust uh, in regulators, in, in our ability to hold bad actors accountable. Uh, and the way to regain that trust, as I've talked about in the past, is to move our cases with a sense of urgency to make sure when folks in mm -hmm. areas of, 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 of in, in gatekeeper roles fall short, that mm -hmm. we hold them accountable. Because when there's somebody like that that falls short on their the responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, that undermines trust. And so mm -hmm. we need to really make a, an effort to hold gatekeepers accountable when they fall short. And then we need to invite the compliance community and the gatekeeper community to work with us because that enhancing that trust is, is beneficial to all of us who work mm -hmm. in the markets, both mm -hmm. regulators, both uh, in-house counsel, both uh, folks who are working in our capital markets, because if people trust the markets are going to invest their hard-earned money in our markets, and mm. that's going to be beneficial to everybody who works around the space. So uh, they will remain a priority for us. The business case for enforcement, huh? The business case for enforcement, okay. yeah. The um, rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, you touched on sanctions a bit, and of course it will be extremely helpful to hear more clarification in terms of um, when... Uh, cooperation has been considered. Is there any, I, you don't have to 
have anything more, but is there anything more in the sanction space that we should all be looking for? So certainly we've, we've touched on the penalties and we've touched on how the numbers have gone up. Um, and I've also talked about how, as you just mentioned, that we're, we're being more intentional in, in, in our orders and the commission is being more intentional in the orders as to the types of behavior that are resulting in cooperation credit. I would also take note of our use of undertakings uh, in, in our orders. When we talk about remedies, uh -huh. I mean, we're using all the tools at our disposal, uh, but there were a number of enforcement actions over the past fiscal year where we really used our ability to impose undertakings in an order to make sure we were addressing risk. Uh, we had a matter with the Options Clearing Corporation mm -hmm. uh, where it revolved around their stress testing and clear, uh, clearing fund methodology mm -hmm. uh, and how they had fallen short uh, in, in a number of ways. And so the undertakings, there was a big penalty in that case, but there was also undertakings that required them to, to put in place certain mechanisms and certain reporting requirements to make sure they were assessing risk correctly, that they were, mm -hmm. uh, their stress testing was, was being done in the right way. And so I, I think that in the end, uh, but enhances protections for investors. So that was one example. Uh, another would be um, we had an enforcement action against Citadel. It was a reg show violation where they mm -hmm. were incorrectly marking millions of short sales long and long sales short. And it related to uh, programming and computer coding issues. And so the undertakings in that particular uh, order required them to have some protections in place where they were checking uh, their programming and their coding logic, and then mm -hmm. you know making sure that these errors were not uh, manifesting again. So I think those are examples of us using our ability to impose undertakings to mm -hmm. to find ways to protect investors through those um, types of provisions. Interesting. You know, the use of undertakings has sort of ebbed and flowed over yeah. the years, and so um, that that's very helpful to. Yeah, and in the crypto with. cases too, right? Uh, like right. in our Stoner Cats, it was an NFT case mm -hmm. uh, where the undertakings required them to destroy the remaining Stoner mm -hmm. Cat NFTs. So, mm -hmm. uh, so useful in, in a number of different contexts. Yeah, no, very interesting. You know, um, I have sort of witnessed firsthand and certainly heard from others that, um, that sometimes you and Sanjay Wadwa, your deputy, and you will meet with defense counsel, sometimes not. And I can't say I, I know the pattern. <coughs> Is there anything that you can uh, highlight for us in terms of when? And, and I will say, many times meeting with the, the senior officer on the matter is extremely useful and helpful. But is there anything you can tell us as to when you, and of course, we're all always told that you have reviewed and, and they've spoken with you. And I take that to be truthful. But when, when, are, when do you get involved in a meeting or not? So, so I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this up, and it's an important question because the Wells process is, is a very important process. It's a, an important part uh, of what we do, and, and what we do is try to get it right. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing our investigations. We're trying to make sure we follow the facts wherever they lead. We're trying to make sure that we're understanding, uh, you know, the, the, the interplay between the facts of a case and, and, and the rules and the regs and making sure that, you know, our analysis is tight because we want to make the right recommendation to the commission and ultimately the commission will decide on the enforcement actions we bring. The Wells process helps us because mm -hmm. sometimes we might have a certain view of the facts and, and a Wells submission or a meeting might result in bringing other facts to light or raising other issues that we should consider. Uh, because just because we can bring an enforcement action doesn't always mean that we should bring an enforcement action in a particular space. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Because there might be other ways to address right. what's going on uh, in a particular uh, matter. And so it's a serious process. It's one that, that we don't take lightly. And I think it's, it's that respect for that process that has driven us to make sure that we're taking the meetings in the cases where there are real factual contentions, real factual disputes, real programmatic concerns, real disputes on, on where the law is and, and, and what the legal issues are in a particular case. Having said that, you know, the, the meetings that we turn down are not that many. I, we mm -hmm. do take a lot of, of the Wells meetings because we want to get it right and we want to make sure we're hearing uh, from the defense bar because you all, uh, the bar that we deal with in this space is, is is excellent and, and, and the submissions are excellent. So there have been many instances where we've taken meetings and it hasn't changed our, our, our view on the facts of a case. There have been instances where we've taken meetings and it has changed our view and we've mm -hmm. decided 
not to recommend an enforcement action to the commission. And there have been many cases where we've read the well submission, where we've reviewed what's been put in, and just on the basis of a well submission, had a conversation with the teams and said, you know what, 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 are, the, like, what are the issues right here that, that defense counsel is bringing up? Let's talk about them. Mm -hmm. And based on those internal conversations, we've narrowed our, 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 our look and, and, and the parties that we're looking at or the individuals or, or decided to walk away altogether. So uh, it's a serious process, but it's one that you know, we want to be efficient with as well mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we want to make sure we're putting in the time for the meetings that raise those types of issues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we all know there are not every case touches those issues, right? Mm -hmm. Of the 1,500 or so open matters mm -hmm. that we have, uh, not every case is going to require a Wells meeting at the end. Right. Of the 780 actions that we brought, not every case is going to be touching on novel issues or have real factual contentions. And so, uh, so that's really how we approach it. And there's a tremendous amount of process because it, the, the Wells meeting might happen at the SO level. The submissions will uh, always be included in what we provide to the commission. And, and there will be conversations about those submissions, even if there wasn't a Wells meeting or if there was a Wells meeting. And so it's a pretty robust process. And I think this just makes sure we're focusing on the right cases. Well, I think that'll be your final word. And thank you okay. so much, Kabir. <laughs> As thank always, you. a pleasure. Thanks, thank Joe. you. Yeah.